Hello, everyone, and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards, and in this lesson, number 128, we'll take a look at part two of assessing architectural risk, kind of a continuation from the prior lesson, number 127. You can find all of my lessons in Software Architecture Monday on my website, developer2architect.com slash lessons. And this is a place where all of my lessons are, all of the descriptions, uh, extra links for resources, and you can also view these lessons directly within my website or on YouTube. Um, all of my lessons are derived from material uh, taken from these two books that I've recently written with uh, my friend and colleague, Neil Ford. Now, in Lesson 127, we took a look at assessing architectural risk and specifically determining those risk dimensions. In this lesson, we're going to complete that assessment by taking a look at identifying architectural risk. Now, we stopped the prior lesson, number 127, uh, with this kind of view here. We determined all of our context as well as our criteria. However, how do we actually go about identifying the actual risk of a particular uh, criteria as well as uh, context in that dimension? Now, let me show you where these numbers come from. One of the ways of identifying risk to reduce the level of subjectivity within that risk of saying something's always high or sometimes medium or low is to try to objectify it a little bit more. And this grid is really useful for doing that. Notice that there's two access points, the impact of that risk and the likelihood. And if we assign low, medium, and high as numbers, we start having multipliers to get the number within each of these grids. For example, uh, the quadrants right here are multiplied together and give us one and two, that would be low risk. Anything that's three to four, notice the medium impact, medium likelihood would be a risk level of four. Uh, three to four is medium, and then six to nine would be deemed high risk. And this is one way of not only being able to identify and objectify risk in terms of impact and likelihood, but also to be able to generate that number. And I'll show you how we can actually leverage that. So let's actually do this as an example. Um, for example, we have an empty grid. Let's start assessing risk. And what I'm curious about is, is there any level of risk? And if so, what is that for our test taking portion on elasticity? Now, if you didn't watch the prior episode, uh, Lesson 127, uh, you might want to go back and stop this to look at that to see where we came up with all of these dimensions. So here is that test taking system that we looked at in Lesson 127. And specifically, what I want to do here is take a look at the test taking area. And so I'm going to isolate that piece and start assessing elasticity risk. And notice, we do have some risk areas here. The test taker has to scale up to 120,000 concurrent students. We may have somewhere from 20 to 120,000. So let's say, is there any risk for elasticity issues here? And in fact, I see a couple of places where we might have some risk. Uh, the first is in the test taker, because that has to query this database to be able to read the next question. And we don't have a whole lot of database connections. Is that going to be able to both query fast enough? And is that database going to be able to scale also up to 120,000? Now, once a student ends up answering a question, it comes into test taker. Test taker sends that answer to a queue and then delivers up the next question, which is that query from the database. Here's your next question. The auto grader then picks up that question, auto grades it, and ends up persisting that answer in a database. And in fact, I see some risk right here in terms of that queue possibly filling up because the auto grader needs to dequeue and then insert into a database. But we may have 120,000 requests every second, which is possible. And so I see these two areas of risk. Well, that's high risk. But let's try to qualify it using that matrix and grid. What I usually like to do when I'm assessing risk is to start out with the overall impact because this is usually easier to answer. What is the impact if the test taker can't keep up 
with delivering questions. It's too slow because of that elasticity problem. Now, that impact is high. I'm going to put that as an impact of high because if the test taker can't keep up with querying questions, uh, the students, it's just going to be too slow and the student's going to be waiting too long for the next question. And there's some risk there. What if the queue fills up as we're starting to deliver answers and the broker can't handle any more messages? I think that impact is also very high because what that means is the student won't be able to answer any questions. And that moves our matrix notice down to the bottom level of high. So my risk might be medium, high, or really high, three, six, or nine. How do I further qualify it? Let's take a look now at the likelihood of that risk occurring. Well, what's the likelihood that the test taker won't be able to keep up with those reads? Well, it certainly is a likelihood that it's not going to be able to keep up because of database weights, but it is only reading that data. And we may be able to optimize that database for reads. And so I think the likelihood of it not being able to keep up is probably a two. Multiplying these together gives us an overall risk of six, which is high risk. Let's take a look at the queue. What's the likelihood that the auto grader won't be able to dequeue fast enough and that queue might fill up? Well, since the auto grader is grading, it's doing an operation, and then writing to a database, those writes usually take a lot longer than reads. And so for that, I think the likelihood is three, that in a high volume testing mode, we won't be able to keep up and that queue will fill up. And that puts that risk at a nine. Now let's go back over to our risk area here. So now notice our quadrant here. What I usually do when I'm doing a domain-based assessment is even though the test taker with the database is a six, the other one is a nine. So I usually take the highest risk area and add that onto what that overall risk is for the domain. So if we go back to here, we can say test taking elasticity is now a nine. That's really high risk area that we won't be able to keep up. And we continue to do this for all the other quadrants. Assessing risk, now sometimes if there's no risk, I'll either put a one, meaning it's the lowest of low, or if it doesn't apply, sometimes I'll use a zero or I'll say an A, so that it just there's no risk there, it doesn't matter. Now what we can do here is take these actual numbers that we derived from that matrix and start accumulating them both horizontally as well as vertically. And there's a lot of value to this because if I get the question, so based on all of our criteria, all of these architecture characteristics, which one are we at most risk on? And why that's number 13 here, which would be availability. And so I know that's the area we should probably focus on most. The next one would be data integrity and elasticity. And so we can leverage these numbers as sums to know what our highest and lowest risk areas are. And as a matter of fact, we can do that by the context as well. And we see across our entire system, the one with the highest level of risk here happens to be test taking. That should be our primary priority. And so these are ways of just leveraging these architecture risk assessments. And so now in the prior lesson, we saw how to create those dimensions and identify those dimensions, but this is one technique that we now saw to be able to actually assess all of the risk. And so this has been Lesson 128, Assessing Architectural Risk Part 2, where we actually saw how to identify the risk. Now we do have one other part coming up, and that is Part 3, which is now qualifying and actually measuring that risk. And that does something very interesting to the matrix that we just saw. And I'm going to hold off on that surprise until lesson 129, when we actually close the architectural risk kind of pathway here and look at measuring architectural risk. Until then, uh, which will be in two more Mondays, um, uh, stay tuned and thank you so much for listening.